All right, so this is our third class, and this is also the first time we're actually going to get into a lab. So you guys will get to start doing uh, some hands-on stuff. And I also need to be specific because I picked some pretty uh, spicy topics for us to start researching. Uh, the kind of recon that we're going to be doing is passive uh, this time. So we're not actually going to be touching these targets in a way that would allow them to know that you were researching them. That's kind of the point of these tactics. So we'll choose kind of edgy or fun topics to make it exciting and uh, get it uh, to be interesting for you on our first lab. So we're going to talk about the first phase of an attack, which we discussed last time, and that is recon. So recon is uh, probably something you've all done before. Uh, a way that you might have encountered it is if you've ever had somebody uh, messaging you and they're not who they say they are. And you have to, you notice that something's off and you figure out that it's actually someone who wasn't say they were, or catfishing. So if you've ever had someone stalking you online or sending you messages and you find out who they are through them slipping up and re revealing their real identity, that's an example of practical recon that people do uh, sometimes online uh, when they're faced with someone who's not being honest. Uh, if you've ever found someone's social media information from their phone number uh, to learn more about them, and then maybe once you have their name, you paste that into Google and learn more about them that way, that's a form of recon. Uh, if you've ever explored uh, the relationships between a user and their friends to learn more about their social group or what they're interested in, that's also a type of recon. Uh, if you found information from uh, photos that a target posts and interpret those, interpreted those to be more meaningful by putting them in context, that is also recon. And if you've ever done something like the Wayback Machine, where you're able to access cached uh, versions of deleted websites, uh, is an example of how you're accessing information that isn't available to anyone who's just kind of looking for it, but not knowledgeable of where to find it. Now, another example would be using custom search variables when uh, doing searches, like using exact quotes uh, to make sure that Google searches for literals instead of interpreting what your search is uh, actually meaning, and also limiting search results by date. Because if you know about when uh, the result that you're looking for would have gone live, there's really no point in including every single thing that's ever been posted on the internet. In fact, it's very wasteful. Uh, so if you've searched through government or city databases to uh, look for business filings or anything like that, that is searching private databases. That is a type of OSINT. And then if you've done a reverse Google image search to find other related websites or people using the same image, that's another example you might have done. So these are skills that you already have, uh, but they're also very expensive skills. Uh, in the business uh, kind of community, business intelligence is a real art and science uh, of learning about your competitors and your uh, environment that you're operating in through these same kinds of tools. So when I worked at startups and when I briefly worked at Uber, I worked in their uh, Uber Eats department and my job was to help locate uh, different restaurants that would want to be part of our program. But most of them were small businesses that had uh, virtually no presence on the internet. So it was very difficult for us to find the email address or contact information for some of these small business owners. So businesses like this like are, are not able to make sales if they're not able to make contact. And besides just understanding about how to set up a business or what businesses might already be operating in a space, it also gives you the ability to you know, very quickly learn things that otherwise would be very expensive to develop. So in this context, we're talking about ethical hacking. So hackers use recon to facilitate cyber attacks. Now, in order for you guys to understand what kind of information we're looking for and what kind of information will be relevant and powerful in uh, this kind of scenario, you'll need to understand what a cyber attack looks like and break it down into the kind of information that would be useful to accomplish that goal. So a cyber attack is designed as something that basically uh, violates one of the pillars of information assurance. Now, what that means is a network is generally designed to provide the services it's de designed to provide, and then also have enough integrity for it to be managed and kind of uh, like work on a continuous basis. If you interfere with any of those things, you are committing a cyber attack by this definition. So some examples would be to steal a file um, that you don't have access to, would be a violation of confidentiality. Uh, to deface a web page uh, so it doesn't display the information that users are relying on having uh, would be a violation of integrity. Uh, to bring down a DNS server. Now, if you don't know, a DNS server is kind of like the address book of the internet. When you type in a URL like um, youtube.com, uh, a DNS server gets that and looks at the actual IP address of the, DNA, of the uh, website and then goes and gets the information from there and loads it. If you were to uh, bring down the DNS server, which actually happened, uh, I think it was in early 2017 from a bunch of Internet of Things devices all attacking a DNS server, you get the result where nobody can use the Internet. So that is a, a denial of avail availability. Um, so sending a malicious email from someone else's account, uh, when you can look like another, another user, uh, that is an example of non-repudiation, I just looked that up, whatever that, yeah. 
Reputation, yes. Uh, so that's the ability to look like someone else so you can't be attributed. Attributed, yeah. Anyway, uh, if you, for example, were able to send something as another user um, and you were not able to tell the difference between, uh, I think a better example would be uh, a key card system. A key card system is designed to be able to identify who comes in and out of a door. But if you share your key card with everyone, it doesn't really do its function. And that would be a violation of uh, non reputation uh, so then the final one would be to steal someone's login credentials. Uh, that would be a violation of authentication. Authentication is used to you know, permit somebody access to a specific type of files, maybe a specific uh, like area. And if you violate that, then you are violating one of the pillars of information assurance. So these are the fundamentals of upon which a cyber attack is based. Generally, if you're committing a cyber attack, it's going to be violating one of these things. Otherwise, it's not really an attack. So when you start to think about the way that you attack an organization, these are the points that you'll begin to build your attack based on, and these are the things that will ultimately um, be what benefits the person who is uh, executing this attack. Now, you have to consider the source of the attack, the person who's actually committing it. If this is a nation state, then perhaps they want uh, specific emails or they want information, in which case a uh, denial of service attack probably wouldn't be very useful to them. They would be much more interested in stealing login credentials, stealing a file, um, sending a malicious email so that they could trick somebody else in the company to disclose information. Those would all be things that would be beneficial to them, but if you are uh, somebody, let's say, that just wants to spread ransomware and make money by charging people to unlock their own files, then availability is what you're attacking. Because suddenly you've made all their files unavailable, and for something like a hospital or a police station, that means that they can no longer function. So. There are barriers to a cyber attack uh, in the modern world, and most systems will have these features, and it's important to understand what they look like when you're looking at a target. Now, you don't need to get too technical about this, because in actual fact, the majority of attacks that are effective bypass these systems by leveraging human weaknesses, and part of our recon will explore that as well. So, the barriers to a cyber attack, uh, let's say that you want to read someone else's traffic online. Let's say you're on the same wireless network just like you all are uh, on the PCC network, I assume, and you wanted to start looking at the traffic that other people were looking at. Now, the problem is if you're going to a web page that has HTTP, HTTPS implemented, it means that everything's encrypted. So unless you have the encryption key, which you don't, you're not able to see the traffic and it keeps that person's information private. So that is something that would prevent you from breaking into that system. Uh, the next would be password authentication. So you can't just walk up to a user's computer if they've set a strong password and open it and you know, log in and get a file. You have to log in. And if you don't know the password, that's a way that you can shut down a cyber attack because the, the attacker would not know, you know the credentials in order to get in. The next is a firewall. A uh, firewall is a system that basically allows or disallows collect, uh, connections based on a set of rules to minimize the risk of somebody uh, accessing the system who's not supposed to be. So a firewall is kind of an automated way that most companies or most servers will prevent malicious connections or shut down things that are deemed suspicious. Um, certificates are something that will prevent malicious files from being installed in place of real ones. Um, you can use things like, uh, like the hash of a file that you download or other things to verify that it is what it says it is and it's published by who, says, uh, who it says it is published by. And then finally, hashing and salting. Um, so if you have valuable databases as a developer, if you do not hash and salt your password databases, you're basically waiting for someone to take them because they are much less useful if they are strongly secured. So this is a way where even if someone was able to break into your system, if they get a database full of hash and salted uh, passwords, it's not as useful to them because you've taken precautions on behalf of your users. So the focus of reconnaissance is usually to uh, find the weakest link of the target. Uh, there's no point in going after anything that's too strong. And in an organization like uh, is typical today, there are a lot of different pieces. And any one of them can be the weakest link. So once you know your objective, be it to cause a denial of service or to break in and steal a file, the next step will be to find the weakest uh, point to kind of give you the path of least resistance to that objective. So. We'll need to start looking at information uh, about, actually, let me explain this diagram a little bit as well. So you can see kind of, and I'll step back and take a look at this one too. So if we're looking at a specific computer, like uh, one of your devices, or maybe a cell phone, you have to look at it in the context that it exists online, um, because that's probably how you'll be accessing it. So in the very center, we have the host, which is your computer, with the administrator password plugged in. That allows you to install files. You can do anything you want. You have complete control over the computer. 
The next layer out is uh, the target host, but unprivileged, unprivileged. So that's just uh, regular access where before you type in the password, you're restricted from doing certain things that might be deemed uh, damaging to the computer. And generally, the operating system will treat you with a certain degree of skepticism because it knows that you're not the, the owner, effectively. Uh, the next one out is the host network. So if you're on the person's network, you can begin to start probing and even begin to start trying to access the, the device directly because you can use the router to effectively relay your communication and start directly probing uh, for weaknesses. Now, let's say, as an example, you were running a, a port 80, uh, a web server, on your uh, computer. That would not be an issue uh, for it to be attacked from the general internet. However, if there was somebody on your local network, they could see it very easily and try to connect to it and uh, just do whatever they want. So uh, the final step out is the internet. So from the router, uh, which is kind of the gateway, uh, you will have the general internet, and the router will have a firewall that will prevent certain traffic from coming in. So if you're an attacker, if you already have access to the target's home network or their work network, you're already two rungs in, basically, uh, because you're not working with the firewall and you're not working with the internet. You're actually to the point where you are at the uh, communicating with the target host and looking to get into the specific device. So. This is the way you can look at how modern computers and modern uh, devices like cell phones and such are targeted uh, and the different kind of layers you can peel back as you get closer and closer to your objective. If you can go from the internet to the subject's router, that gives you access to all the hosts on the network and from there you can work on getting access to a privileged host, which once you have it, that's called rooting. Once you have a rooted uh, box on the network, it's kind of a, like a beachhead or a, like a something that you can reliably use to attack the rest of the network that will respond to your controls and basically give you a persistent presence on the network. So when we look at a network a little bit closer, there will be generally multiple hosts on the network. And you can see that they'll have, it looks like little holes in it, but they're ports that are open, allowing for certain types of communication. Now we can scan for these, and we can attempt to connect to them. And that's more kind of active reconnaissance, which we won't get too much into today. But this is the kind of information that we'll begin to learn once we break things down from a internet level down to a host level and start looking at the individual devices on the network and what they run. But this also does apply to servers. So if you're looking at web servers and other things that are publicly hosted on the internet, you can start scanning them or learning other information about what services they offer and what kind of stuff they let in. Now, with the invention of uh, Shodan and other search engines that are able to find devices just wholesale on the internet with services running, that's why you can just log in to like a random webcam in Brazil or like somewhere else uh, that just has the default credentials logged in. So devices that are shared publicly on the internet are a really good example of why it's super important to change those credentials anytime you have a device that has default credentials like this. Because if they're exposed directly, a hacker will be able to find them in the stage of reconnaissance and that will be the weakest link. So what kind of information are we looking for with reconnaissance? Um, we're looking for network information. So that's IP addresses, subnet masks, uh, network structure and topography. How many devices are on the host? Are devices allowed to connect with each other on the same network? If you've ever been to a coffee shop that has a captive portal, you'll be restricted to your own subnet, which means you can't do things like communicate with other computers on the network, because why, why would they want you to? It's a coffee shop. They don't want you doing that. So a typical network that isn't set up to be defended will allow everybody to communicate. It's important to know that about your target before you plan your attack. Because if your attack depends on getting into a device and then using that device to connect to another device, you're going to be kind of screwed if you didn't notice that that's not even allowed on the network in the first place. Then we're going to look at domain names, like what does that person own? Because a domain name will point to all this kind of other information and can be a really rich source of data. We're going to look for host information. So that's information about the actual computers and hardware in use uh, by the target. That's operating system type, uh, system architecture, what is it actually built on, um, and then user and group names for like network devices. Uh, finally, we'll look at security policies. That's going to be password complexity and uh, how often they need to change those passwords. Now, if you know that passwords need to be at least eight characters, they need to involve this, this, and this, you can throw out every password that doesn't meet that requirement, and it actually makes your job, if you're trying to crack a password, much easier. Because you can cut down the list of possibilities down to things that are much more specific based on those known security policies. So uh, physical security. Do they use key cards? Do they use keys? Did you know you can take a picture of a key with a high resolution camera and make a copy if it's just a physical metal key? So if you know more about the way that your subject does their physical security, you can enable things like accessing something that's only secured behind a locked gate. And that can be the weakest link. Now, if they use shitty um, like RFID cards, that, you know, tap cards that you use to like, get in, you can clone those very easily. 
if they use keys and they wear them on the outside. You can copy those with a photo. There's all kinds of different ways. Uh, also, if they just use bad locks, you don't need to copy anything. You can just pick your way inside, especially if there's no cameras on the area. So physical, physical security is often overlooked, but it's an integral part of this because, again, you are not looking to exercise a specific skill. That will build a fingerprint, and you don't want to build a fingerprint because you want to go with the weakest link. And you should adapt your strategy to whatever the weakest link is, not play to your strengths. If you're going to do this sort of stuff, eventually, if you play to your strengths all the time, people are going to know it's you because you always do the same stuff. So if you want to be good at this, it's important to take in all the different aspects that can be attacked, including the physical, and not rule anything out that might not initially come to mind. Now, hackers don't always have the best social skills, so it differentiates well-resourced organizations that commit high-level attacks and individuals who are just kind of looking for money is the fact that well-resourced organizations use social uh, interactions all the time. They are not scared to bluff or lie or make a phone call because they know that often physical security will be the weakest link. So uh, firewalls are another piece of physical security. Um, intrusion detection systems, that means uh, systems that are designed to autom automatically detect attacks and either respond to them or alert someone who actually knows what it means. So then we go for human information. Who works at the company? Um, home addresses, phone numbers, frequent hangouts of employees, where they, uh, where they let their guard down. Computer knowledge, uh, so how capable are they? Are they going to be able to spot a really obvious attack or are they so incapable that they lose their password all the time and they would never notice? Hobbies and interests, um, how, what can you do to get their attention? If the weakest link is a person, if the easiest way to get into a system is a person, then how can you get that person to notice you and respond to you? And then finally, organizational information. So. Everything, especially in the United States, that you do as a business leaves a paper trail. Uh, because those organizations that you leave a paper trail with are public, government organizations, that's typically open data, which means you can access it and you can use it. So an example I would like to give is if you're looking for a, a small business in California, you can go to the California Secretary of State and you can look at the corporation filings and see the signatures of the main people behind the business clearly on the paperwork, which you can download. So if you're looking to forge paperwork, for example, and you need the signature of a CEO, it's literally available online, and you can just copy and paste it. So this kind of information is really powerful because it gives you access to high-level paperwork that these people have filed in order to run their business or organization, and it generally will tell you a lot about what they do, and it can even tell you things like tax information, how much money they make, and that sort of, uh, that sort of stuff. Now, that's also the stuff that will be really valuable if any of you decide to go into business intelligence. Uh, it's a, kind of the civilian branch of open source intelligence that deals with getting the right information for businesses making to, looking to make large investments. Now, this kind of information and gathering it into a coherent picture and being able to basically translate just raw data into perspective for investors or other people that make decisions is really the value uh, that this kind of trade brings to the general community. But in the context of uh, hacking, it very narrowly is used to kind to find these vulnerabilities and direct the attack flow. So uh, aside from that, we'll need to find employees, uh, email address formatting. So that means what kind of, uh, if we were to generate an email address for an employee we find, if in the first couple of instances we f of email addresses we find, we figure out the formatting so we can generate one based on uh, someone's name, all we need is a list of people that work there to generate a list of email addresses that will actually get in touch with their employees if they all use the same formatting for like first name, last name, stuff like that. So the types of data that we want, again, network information, domain names, topography, uh, human information, this is an, exam is an example of uh, domain name information. So if you have a terminal, uh, this is kind of a Linux type thing, a lot of systems will have this automatically, and this isn't our general focus. I'm gonna be going over some tools that you might need Python or you might need some other things to download, and I have some assigned reading, well, attached optional reading as well if you want to explore these tools. I just know that it's gonna be a little bit difficult for everyone to try to install them today. So if you wanna try some of these, you can try running them in a terminal now and see if it works, and if it doesn't work, you can explore it later. So this is just a simple who is query. You can run these online as well. You don't necessarily need to do it from a terminal, but it's, it's certainly fancier too. Uh, just running a who is query will give you information about the person who registered the domain. Now typically, uh, if you're smart, you will use the privacy option where none of this information will be made public because most people don't realize it's going to be made public online. But people that are inexperienced or maybe if the website was done by someone earlier on will leave this information on and it can do things like tell you the email address of the people that registered it so that you can trace it down and find other domains that they own. Um, so something that is important to understand the difference between is active versus passive reconnaissance. Now, 
What is the difference between launching a denial of service attack against a company to see how much capacity it can handle and reviewing the public log data that would reveal the same information? Now, one, if we're just being pure researchers, one is primary source data. We're able to record the information ourselves. We get the most accurate possible data. And the other is secondary source data, where somebody else has collected the information, and it might be accurate. But in this scenario, the secondary source data is actually better because it leaves a smaller footprint and has a lower possibility for detection of what we're trying to do. Now, the worst thing we can do is tip off a target that we're planning an attack because they'll dramatically scale up their security and it will make our job much harder. So in general, passive recon is the best thing to do in this sort of situation because it, uh, it minimizes the amount of contact you have with the target while still learning enough to be able to proceed with the attack. So the first example, um, do, launching a DDoS attack, is something that would definitely get you recognized very quickly. You're creating a situation where you're actually affecting their business. Anybody who's involved in security at that company will immediately know that an IP address is attacking them, and it will get their attention right off the bat. If you were to go to a third party and make that inquiry, then that would be something that would not alert them because anybody could making that, uh, be making that search. And especially if you mask your IP or take other steps to make sure that you're not being, having your search, searches logged, that would be a better way of getting the same kind of information. So navigating to a website or looking at the information about it from a third party is probably not going to alert a target. Um, in passive recon, again, we don't want to have any unnecessary contact with the target. In fact, if we can have zero direct contact with the target's network, that is the best scenario. Now, using a third party or a proxy to uh, you know, do the activities we want to do if they're more active is a way to go about that. We're not going to do that, please, in any of our scenarios. Uh, we're going to use purely passive means to be able to gather information that's been made publicly available online to build a picture of these organizations. So active recon discovers information, again, directly from interactions with the target. Uh, and it's the complete flip version. Instead of avoiding it, we go right in and we basically um, try to find the most efficient way to get information from those interactions so we can hopefully minimize them. So this is thing, uh, things like a ping, Nmap, which will scan a network and tell us uh, exactly what ports are open, or traceroute to tell us the route that a particular connection takes in order to get from us to a target. So all that information is really valuable, but it comes at the cost of potentially alerting the target that uh, there's some malicious activity at hand and kind of where we're looking. So if we project where we're looking ahead of, hand, uh, ahead, ahead of what we're doing, it's very likely that those are the areas that they'll harden, which makes our observations kind of not as useful. So before we hyper-focus on OSINT, because that's the most popular uh, kind of methodology for, for getting this information, I want to make sure you guys are aware that there's other types of uh, information gathering practices that are equally, if not more, effective. In fact, a blend of these techniques is the best way to go. So if you are able to be comfortable with multiple different types of intelligence gathering, your, OSINT, your um, reconnaissance will be much, much better because you'll have multiple sources and be able to confirm and find things that other people would not. So human or human intelligence is the art of getting people to develop information bearing relationships. Now that means that it doesn't mean that they like you. It doesn't even mean that they are aware that they are giving you information or purposefully giving you information. And it definitely doesn't mean that they're aware they're giving you important information because typically that's not the case. An information bearing relationship is a relationship where through whatever interaction you've normalized with the subject, them telling you information that's pertinent to whatever it is you need to know is part of the deal. So an example would be a sales agent um, bringing a cup of coffee to uh, the receptionist at a trade organization every morning when uh, he sees her. So he can find out what ha just happened at the board meeting and get inside information about what's happening at the organization that they want to make a deal with. Or it can be something as extreme as blackmail, where you find information about someone that would be embarrassing and you coerce them into working with you or sharing information because you could let that go and embarrass them. Uh, another example would be actually uh, a, a technique I really like where you blend OSINT and HUMINT and you approach someone with all the information you've gathered from an open source perspective. So that's like permits, like every violation they've ever had for anything and just create this thick, ridiculous looking folder of data about that business that's way more than the average manager, probably even owner, remembers in their brain. And then when you speak to them, you have constantly reference this thing and just look like you have all the information in the world about them. And to them, they think that you already know everything. So why would they be the least bit concerned about telling you anything? Because you know more about they do, uh, about when their business was founded, how many people work there. Because you seem to possess more knowledge than they do, they don't think that their knowledge is specific, important, or confidential. So by kind of creating this uh, relationship where they see you as a very knowledgeable person that already has all this data that would you know, not find what they have 
the least bit interesting. You can create a, a normal seeming conversation that's actually incredibly information bearing that could give away enough to be the weakest link in our scenario. So human intelligence, once you identify the people behind the organization, is often the best way to mix these techniques and get, uh, if you get blocked with uh, open source intelligence, break that silo and be able to get information that would not be available online, would not be available to the average outsider. So another type of intelligence is signals intelligence. Now, during this course, we're also going to talk about hacking Wi-Fi, and part of that is going to be signals intelligence, which is intercepting communications uh, from uh, Wi-Fi connections and using that to learn about the origins. Now, on a high level, that means taking random radio signals, interpreting them, and learning something like, okay, there are 15 Dell computers in this office all connected to this network, and there's four network extenders just by walking past and listening to those signals. So that kind of information is really valuable because we can use it to identify when someone comes and goes. We can use it to identify which networks they have permission to connect to. We can use it to clone uh, that information and appear to be them when we uh, connect to a network to hide our presence. So SIGINT is something where if you have physical proximity to a target, it's actually so accessible nowadays that you can download, if you have an Android phone, wiggle Wi-Fi, walk through a building and find every vulnerable Wi-Fi network to go back and attack later. Uh, that kind of power gives you the ability to really know what's out there without having to see it with your own eyes, because many of these vulnerabilities will be invisible. They won't be something that you can actually look, look at, touch. Like These are uh, very kind of abstract concepts. So being able to interpret radio signals nearby, and specifically Wi-Fi signals, is a way that you can use the same techniques that like the military and government and intelligence agencies use to learn about other things, uh, to practically learn about either your own wireless environment or other things that are connected uh, to a target. So open source intelligence is an ocean of data. That's the problem. Um, you will get a ton of results for any search that you run, and that's not good. You might think that it's good, but it's actually bad, because what you want is one result, the perfect result on the first search. That's the mark of a good researcher. If you can find the perfect amount of the perfect source and the perfect bit of information you need to answer a question, uh, because the hard part is not getting drowned in all the data that's returned on one of these searches. So, Open source intelligence is a branch of both the military and, and civilian intelligence services. Uh, again, it's a core part of business intelligence. And the most data nowadays is found in APIs on social mm -hmm. media and in other types of uh, information databases that could be easily accessed to display relationships. So uh, the majority of that information is not available on Google, um, meaning it's held in these databases that need to be accessed either with specific arguments or queries in order for the databases to make sense or produce results, or otherwise don't uh, have results that would be cached by a standard search engine. So uh, people contribute tons of information about themselves via social media. They post photos that clearly identify their location. They include metadata on photos they upload that allow the, you to do things like identify their apartment. You can even get as specific as being able to identify where someone's been just by looking at the photos that they posted. And an example I'll give is an investigation I did where someone was paying uh, our company to find someone who'd stolen a bunch of money from a business and then fled the country. Um, she'd locked down her social media but after some investigation, we found out that her mother had not locked down her social media and had tagged a bunch of photos uh, when she'd visited her daughter uh, at a hotel room, which had a specific type of water bottle that is only sold in Saudi Arabia. So after a couple, uh, and you just Google the brand and you see it's only sold in one place. So after a couple um, reverse Google image searches that found another uh, social media account that was also didn't have a password on it, we were able to find photos of the skyline, which clearly identified it as Dubai. So we were able to track down this lady who thought she was being very secretive just because she had a water bottle uh, that was only sold in one country, and then because her mother didn't have her social media protected. So the amount of uh, information people leak about themselves, either through friends who are negligent or careless, or through other sources that's just like directly reporting it or posting it, uh, that can provide you a ton of information about your targets. So the intelligence cycle needs to be understood because it's something that will separate you from someone who just uh, gathers a bunch of information and thinks they did a good job. Um, and information and data are not the same thing as intelligence. Intelligence is context and understanding from whatever the information is you found. If you find a pattern and you can communicate that pattern and what it means to someone who's going to make a decision, that is intelligence. But if you just gather a big set of data, 
that it, without some sort of conclusion, without some sort of context, without it being actionable information that somebody can really make a decision on, it's not useful to either yourself, if you are the attacker, or to your organization if you're working in a commercial context. So the basic, uh, I was told to stop using that example, the basic set of uh, the uh, intelligence cycle is first direction, decide what information you're looking for, and create an answerable question that really can be answered. And this is something a lot of people do wrong. If you ask a question that is a, an opinion or is not really a strong question, you will not be able to produce accurate results and you will wonder why you're such a bad researcher. But if you mess up this first step, that's where a lot of people will go wrong and create and pr bring in a bunch of data that's not possible to answer the question that they've tried to ask. Next is collection. And that's where you need to know where to go to gather this information. And there's some really good links I'll share with you guys. One of them is the OSINT framework. It's a, an online uh, repository of, inform of tools that you can use to, to take a single piece of data and expand it into much more pieces of data and kind of trace down more. Next is processing. That's where once you get the information, you interpret patterns and you try to understand what it is it's telling you or how it answers the question you've asked. Analysis is where you make the decision as to what the data means. Uh, and you provide the context for anybody else who's going to be reading this. Uh, what does this mean and what can you do about it? Finally, dissemination. You need to make sure that the people who need the information are the ones that have it and that it gets to them in a timely fashion. If you're finding this information out too late or if you're delayed on this, then the people relying on you won't be able to make the decisions that they need to make. And finally, feedback. Uh, if you're not creating an open loop, then you're not iterating and you're not improving on the things that you're doing. So if you're conducting intelligence and you need more information, generally the first loop will not be what, when you get what you need. Often it'll be on the second or the third loop of iterating on the information you just got to better define your question or better define your sources that will bring you the information you're really looking for. So again, we go through this kind of refinement where the, the most valuable stuff is at the top and the stuff that anybody can find is on the bottom. On the bottom, we have data, raw bits, no context, lots of noise. That means we have a bunch of text, a bunch of raw stuff that a computer might be able to kind of show us a relationship with, but the average person would not be able to dig much out of. And then the next is clustered information, filtered, uh, with relationships displayed. This is why we have graphical displays of big data. Uh, informatics is kind of the science of like taking data sets and turning it into a more uh, valuable uh, ways for humans to be able to see relationships they're looking for. And this is where the analyst and really the human is still very much in play. Uh, this is where clever people are able to find information or find patterns that the average machine would not be able to do. And it's where humans still play an essential role in this, even beyond when machines are able to do other parts of this process. And then finally, intelligence is uh, what is produced from those two things. Raw information and then understanding lead to the ability to provide context to people who have no knowledge of the specific situation. So if you cannot explain to someone, uh, rather than reference them to a website that's going to make absolutely no sense to them, that's your source, if you can't explain to them why uh, you're recommending to do a particular thing, then you've lacked the context to really explain it uh, in a way that makes it intelligence. So an example would be when we first uh, started doing this at my organization when I was a researcher, we would have people who would just send us links to the stuff they'd find and expect that to answer our question. Uh, but we would get there and we would have no idea what the information was telling us because we didn't understand the question they'd chosen to ask or we didn't understand the way they were trying to answer. So without that piece of information, you end up just frustrating the people who asked because they didn't, they didn't ask you for a link. They asked you for an answer. So um, some things to remember is when you're automating things like link analysis, feeding bad or irrelevant data into link analysis makes it useless. So you have to be careful about the data sources you add when you take this sort of approach. Because if you add data that uh, creates outliers, you end up diluting the relationships that truly exist, and you end up with an incomplete picture. So we're going to talk about Multego today, and this will be what I'm going to kind of assign anyone who would like to participate in our lab. Multego is a really interesting way to drop information on a canvas and display in graphical terms relationships between that, uh, that and other points of data. Now, the beauty of Multego is to be able to start with a single point of data and expand it into a huge network that tells you a lot about the organization. And that would be something like taking a URL and uh, finding a tracking code that then exists on a bunch of other different uh, websites that the same organization owns, finding more tracking codes and refining that and doing it again and being able to find a complete look at all the uh, uh, web URLs that a particular organization might not acknowledge owning but actually own and monetize through the same tags. Now, if you wanted to do that kind of search manually, it would be really difficult. But with something like Multego, you can refine these searches to learn very specific information about organizations very, very quickly. 
Now, Multego is used by police organizations, it's used by intelligence organizations, and it's also a great way to get around not having a warrant. If you are able to rely on purely open sources of data, you can build, quite frankly, an invasive picture of someone's life uh, with the right amount of persistence and the right amount of knowledge from where to grab these sources. So a really good way of understanding Multego is uh, to think about it as what it is, which is pulling information, lots of information from APIs all together, interpreting it in an algorithm, and then displaying the relationship between that vast data set visually for anybody who's trying to learn. So um, the way that people build on this is to develop what are called transforms, which are commercial uh, packages which have custom APIs that pull from things like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, other useful information sources, twist the data into a way that shows you what you're looking for, and then displays it back to you. So for a police agency, if you're looking to track activists that you can't actually get a, a court order to uh, track, this is the way that you could use their social media postings to very precisely track exactly where they are, who they're talking to, and what their activities are. And this is actually quite frequently what it's used for, because anybody, this software is free, you guys actually, I presume, have downloaded it. It's very easy to launch an investigation that turns up a lot of information that might, most people might assume is confidential or private. Um, so the particular focus on Multego is on social media and technical infrastructure, tracking of people, organizations, and physical hardware. So that's a lot. That's most of what an organization relies on to function. So we'll get into a little bit about how that works after we go over some more basic uh, types of recon. So the most basic type of recon and OSINT is data scrapers. So that means uh, things that will pull together pieces of information that are in disparate places around the internet. So let's say we want to find every uh, email address from The Guardian. This is an example we did during one of our earlier classes. We know that The Guardian is a journalistic uh, organization. They typically use uh, security uh, so people can contact them anonymously, like with things like PGP. So when you sign up for PGP, or Pretty Good Privacy, uh, you actually have to register with a key server, which is searchable. So if we want to find every single email address at this organization so we can email every single person with, let's say, a phishing scam, we could very easily use a tool called the Harvester, which is a Python tool, which if you have Python on your computer, you can download and run. And with a couple arguments, in this case, just saying the uh, domain we're looking for is The Guardian, uh, limit it to 500 results and search the PGP key server. This will pull every single email address associated with that organization so that we can refine that data and learn more about them. Now that can be inferred as an email, uh, like an employee list, because once we understand the way that these are formatted, we can also use it to begin to search for employees with that same data. Um, so another tool is the OSINT framework, and this is something that I mentioned. Uh, this is just a simple HTTP website. You can access it right now if you want, and it has things like, uh, actually I'll show you guys. So the OSINT framework looks like this. Once you enable all that, there we go. So if we just start with a username, we can see all the different search engines that we can run in order to learn more about that username. If we want to look through dating profiles, we can look through all these wonderful dating profiles. And uh, if we want to see those horrible websites that do reviews of users, woman savers, oh god, I didn't even know that existed. There's a lot of stuff that you'll be afraid of once you find out it exists. Uh, this is just a good example of some things. Uh, dark web resources, if you wanted to learn about that. Maps, transportation, business records. The screen is getting overwhelmed, but you can understand that there's a ton of ways to take a single point of data, run it through something like this, and learn much more about whatever it is you're targeting. So, beginner OSINT would be things like uh, purpose-built Python tools like the operative framework. Now, the operative framework allows you to do things that are pretty clever, such as finding the default passwords of any devices that you encounter, or on the more OSINT side, you can find uh, basically anybody who owns multiple websites or multiple web domains by running their email address through a reverse search and collecting anything that matches. So if you want to know, and especially individuals that might prolifically kind of buy web domains just because they like to or might have multiple projects going on, you can see who's registered multiple web domains by running uh, the operative and then uh, searching through the modules and running the emails to domain module. So as you can see, uh, this is just a Python script. Actually, let me see if I have it. No, I switched to something else, sorry. Um, it's just a Python script that you'll input a little bit of information about the target and then run a search query, and it'll bring you back more information that you can use to take the next step within the menu to pull down more information or find a vulnerability. 
So intermediate uh, OSINT is Multego. So this is learning to drop information into a canvas and then run uh, various transforms on it to pull more data in that's relevant to your investigation. Now I'll show you guys a little bit about how this works, but the kind of context you can think of Multego is it's able to link secretive organizations who use tracking codes. It's able to identify other websites that are on a private server. So if somebody isn't using a, a shared server, you can identify all the other you know, things that they might own or be operating. But if they are on a shared server, sometimes the weakest link isn't even that domain. Sometimes if another uh, web domain on that server is misconfigured, you can br basically break into the server through breaking in uh, to a website that's on the same server but not actually related to your target. So running queries like that will enable you to enumerate different domains that are hosted by the same hardware, um, by the same software in the same server room, and allow you to understand how to attack it in other ways that might not be possible if you didn't have that information. So profiling the technology that a service uses. Uh, with a simple right mouse click running a transform, you can see that it uses the Google MX server, which is the mail server, and that tells you that they use Gmail. So if you need to do something based on Google services, you can pretty much assume at that point that the organization runs like Google, Google Apps for Work or whatever it's called now, and you can like narrow your attack to specifically target that suite of software because, hey, they're using a Google MX server, why would they do that and switch everything else, especially if they're a smaller business? So you can track users by social media and look for links. So that's who's added who, who tags their stuff with who. Um, a lot of this information is also geolocated, so places that people have tagged themselves consistently. You can track a user across an internet, the internet by finding screen names and different instances of those screen names, modifications of the screen name, and new information they'll post in different profiles, and then also find snippets of the same profile text across the web. This includes things like uh, Google reverse searching as a transform to Multego. So if you're able to find a single profile, you can reverse image search the profile photo they're using and find other related profiles on the internet. So even if someone is using a totally different profile information, uh, they're totally different um, even details about them that you wouldn't be able to find with a text search, you can still track down either a user or someone pretending to be that user if they have like maybe fake profiles or something that are happening through a reverse search through Multego. So you can also use this to identify key members of organizations, which will help you in targeting uh, the most important people at that business. So finally, the most advanced uh, type of OSINT we're going to talk about is Buscador OS. So it's an entire uh, Linux OS that's dedicated to OSINT, and I have it running. It's free, you can run it in VirtualBox, and it has all these wonderful tools pre-installed so that you can run investigations and also route all this traffic through something more discreet. The whole purpose of it is to be able to access these tools in a way that's very um, separate from the rest of your system. So if you want to do some low-key research and you want to be able to begin investigating someone uh, or an organization or anything, this is a way that you can compress all that into a single operating system that's optimized for that one specific function and really get your fingers dirty without needing to worry about you know, cleaning up your system after or accessing something that would link back to yourself, uh, which is important for the lab we're going to do today. So. This lab is also something that has been uh, done with the help of the company that puts on Multego. So we did a previous version of this class last semester, um, I think you were there, uh, and they saw the video that we did and they really, really liked it. So they offered us uh, some student licenses for, I think it's a week, uh, I think I can also get them extended for anyone who's interested in trying the classic, a Multego classic product, which is usually like, I think like $600, $500 a year. Um, and it's used by, again, like police agencies, like uh, all sorts of really interesting organizations that need to do these sorts of investigations. If any of you want to explore this further, um, they're really interested in obviously what we're doing because they, they like anyone who puts together good classes on the product. Uh, but if you would like to try this out, uh, anyone who submits a lab today, or well, actually when we meet next, uh, will get a license key for the product so that they can try out the full version and really see some of the transforms that go kind of a step further uh, from what we'll do on the most basic examples. So uh, that means we're going to have groups of two to three people work together. Um, that's important because everybody does research differently. When you're trying to answer a question, people will define the question differently. They'll look for different sources. And it's important for you to see the way that different people do research because they will have different approaches than you immediately think of. And typically, no one result will be better. But learning different ways that people do things is the way that you'll become a better researcher because uh, 
people are clever, uh, especially people in this class are clever. So I imagine that you'll find some things that are surprising. So you don't need to necessarily pair up now, but do exchange information with someone else because if you, you should be working together on this project. So we're going to actually begin profiling a target and begin looking for the weakest link. And in order to do that, we'll need both a target and then an attack scenario. So I've prepared a couple, and once you guys uh, find your groups, I will assign each of you a different attack scenario so that you will begin to support that attack scenario with open source research and build a picture of what that organization looks like or what might be a reasonable way of accomplishing the objective. So to do these, uh, to do these I again want to specify we're going to be conducting passive recon. I do not want you to port scan SpaceX. Please do not do so with any of the organizations we're going to mention. It's, you will get no extra credit for hacking them, um, and it would be bad. Uh, so the point of this is to gather information without alerting them, uh, which would be doing things like uh, the kind of Maltego polls that we'll be doing today. So you'll need to download Maltego, uh, the community edition, Maltego CE. Uh, you'll need Java to run that. And then you'll need to uh, sign up for a account, uh, which is just like a little CAPTCHA. And then, again, uh, we'll be offering the one-week license if you guys are interested uh, once you submit your labs next time. So uh, if you would like to use any of the tools that I've mentioned previously, uh, I will have a list of them available as well as supplementary reading about how to install and use them. You are welcome to do so. Uh, Multego is kind of the baseline, so that's what you should use uh, as a basis. But if you would like to use any of the other data scraping tools or any of the other things I'll cover, including Spiderfoot, which is really, really cool, um, then you are welcome to do so, and it will definitely enhance your results. So the scenarios that we'll research, uh, I named a couple off the bat. One of them is going to be targeting SpaceX. Um, that is, if you don't know, an aerospace company that is located in Inglewood, so it's actually pretty close to us. Uh, and the attack objective is to gain access to senior level email accounts to infect suppliers with malware. So this kind of attack is typically done by breaking into the email account of somebody who deals with invoices or something else and sending a malicious uh, invoice that looks like something they would need to open in order to settle an account or something, because those are typically very important documents that virtually everyone opens. So the next would be Smith & Wesson, which is a firearms manufacturer, not necessarily known very well for being tech, tech savvy, so it's going to be interesting to see what you guys find. The attack scenario would be to steal the password of someone with access to the accounting department's computers or network to leak lobbying activity. So finally, the last one is HackerOne. Uh, HackerOne is a really interesting business that has security researchers and hackers who work uh, on distributed projects to find vulnerabilities in all sorts of different people's products. Now, our attack objective is to steal the identity verification information or the payment information for hackers working for uh, HackerOne so we can unmask all the security professionals that are both active in, in the industry and working for this. Maybe we're a competitor or maybe we're somebody who just wants to find out where all the hackers that are, are making some money on the side are. Now, if you want to design your own attack scenario based on denying access to one of the pillars or violating one of the pillars of information assurance, you can also pick one of the other targets that are located around the Los Angeles area, being Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Bug Crowd, which is another uh, company similar to Hacker One, Rapid7, which is a cybersecurity company also located in Inglewood that's really kind of famous and big within the um, cybersecurity community, and Tesla. So uh, you guys can bring your own targets if you think you have a really good one. Just check with me first. Um, if I'm not, please don't pick the CIA. Just, it's just a bad idea. Um, but if you have any other ideas that are less bad ideas, then feel free to bring them. The spicier, the better. So uh, if you want to read more about this, I'll include this slide that has more links. Um, I've written a series of articles about using these tools. So you can uh, both watch a video on Maltego, uh, which was the presentation that we recorded last semester. Um, a investigation uh, with basically a written example of how to conduct an investigation with Maltego, target fingerprinting with the operative framework, and then email scraping with uh, the harvester.